Uh, hello, everybody. Good day. My name is Todd Lort. I'm a senior geological engineer at the Army Corps Risk Management Center in Lakewood, Colorado. And I'm here today to give a presentation that's going to describe the important geologic and geomorphic considerations for assessing and characterizing internal erosion failure modes that may be associated with dams, levees, or spillway foundations. The overall intent of this presentation is to emphasize the importance of a site characterization and foundation assessment that is detailed and, and comprehensive enough that it informs us about the potential for internal erosion failure mechanisms that might be positioned below a dam or levee or a spillway foundation. And uh, to do this, we are going to have to describe and understand some of the geologic details and subsurface conditions and how those conditions relate specifically to internal erosion or seepage. I'm going to provide a summary, sort of an overall summary of the guiding geologic principles that help us characterize a site, hydrogeology, structural geology, um, geomorphology, we're going to understand a little bit of how those disciplines all play together for assessing foundation conditions. And then we'll discuss also the soil considerations and the rock foundation considerations that relate directly to different internal erosion failure modes or the features that we need to be aware of or try to characterize. We'll also cover a few unique geologic cases so this is more specific to, for example, karst or uh, anthropogenic type of activities. So tunnels or, or drilling in and around the dam foundation or, or levee foundation that can cause problems. And then to do all this, we're going to intermix a few case histories to use as examples that emphasize, um, and emphasize these site investigations or site characterizations that help us evaluate internal erosion failure modes for both soil and rock. Groundwater flows or seepage flows from the reservoir under certain physical parameters of, you know, the gradient and the pressures and the flow velocity will tend to exploit geologically adverse conditions or geologic defects that are in the rock mass that are in the soil deposits or uh, found along contacts between complex geologic structural systems. And these flows will preferentially focus on these zones of differing or even slightly variable hydraulic conductivity or strength. And that is, that's what water will do. It will erode and it will flow and it will uh, enlarge and it will, it will concentrate in these areas of adverse um, hydraulic conductivity conditions. And these conditions need to be characterized within the framework of the site geologic setting because they influence so much of our decision making relative to internal erosion failure modes. They influence seepage flow and flow mechanics and directions within the foundation or abutments. They inform the failure modes related to internal erosion. How's the failure mode work? Is it plucking material from the core? Is it eroding the, eroding the material out into a free face? How is the failure mechanics, how's the erosion mechanics progressing? Um, understanding the site conditions and what's controlling seepage also is applicable to development of the seepage model and understanding how accurately the seepage model is, is portraying our, our foundation conditions. So that leads to our confidence in the seepage model results. And then lastly, our understanding of the foundation related to seepage or, or internal erosion helps us better understand the design and effectiveness of internal erosion monitoring and control features. Are we monitoring in the right place? Was the cutoff effective? 
Is grouting effective? Do we know exactly what's going on or do we need more information? Many of the leaders and pioneers in state of the practice dam engineering consistently emphasized in their writings and in their technical memorandums the importance of the geological conditions that are present in a foundation and how even subtle geologic features can have significant influence on the performance and behavior and design for dams and levees and probably spillways as well. They recognized that many of these um, conditions which cause issues or, uh, per, per, or failures at, at dams were often related to geological conditions that were maybe misinterpreted, ignored, or not considered critical at the time relative to the design and operation of the structure. This perspective is supported by a 1995 ICOLD study where they looked at dam failures that had occurred throughout the 20th century. And when they compiled their information and the failure mechanisms, they found that almost 70% of all the failures were attributed to, attributed to geologic and geotechnical conditions present in the foundation that maybe were mischaracterized or the design was not adequate. The reason is, Full characterization and complete understanding of the foundation conditions can be very, very difficult in complex geologic settings. Okay, this example shows how a limited borehole information and simplified interpretation of the subsurface conditions or extrapolation of data can lead to incorrect subsurface interpretation. So we have limited information. We have an unknown condition in the subsurface. We drill two few inch diameter boreholes, we get samples at perhaps intervals, and we interpret the samples, the soil uh, condition, consistency, we identify contacts between different soil horizons or layers, and then we're able to extrapolate or interpret between borings. And in this instance, we had similar stratigraphy encountered in each of these two borings. That may lead to a simplification of the stratigraphy horizontally and laterally where we, we build a layer cake system and assume those properties extend uh, across a larger area of the site. However, the actual subsurface conditions may be far more complicated. There may be inset channels, truncated channels. There may be gravel lenses, for example, at the base of these channels or fines elsewhere. So the model development, the interpretation of internal erosion, and the, the assessment of our uncertainty relative to our, our internal erosion failure mode evaluation may be severely limited by the fact that the ge geology is maybe more complicated than those two borings and layer cake assumptions have led us to believe. So adequate site characterization takes creative thinking and imagination, it takes experience in implying all of the different principles of geology, geomorphology, structural geology, hydrogeology. We have to understand the processes in relationship to the reservoir and the loading and the groundwater or, or seepage flow conditions. And we also have to have a good understanding of the potential internal erosion failure mode development and mechanics. And all those help us understand better how a limited exploration program or our, our degree of uncertainty because of spatial heterogeneity or anisotropy of the foundation conditions can lead us into to incomplete knowledge of the subsurface. And we may generate incorrect um, assumptions or input parameters. So we use this quote from George Box and discuss it in our in our workshops quite frequently when we're discussing uh, site characterization and also numerical or analytical modeling results because he was the basically the a pioneer and a leader in statistical analysis and theory and his work forms the basis for a lot of numerical models and mathematical analysis tools that are used to predict behavior of various processes so when we apply these into you know, geotechnical models or seepage and stability models, we have to understand that 
they cannot fully capture the complexities of actual in situ geologic subsurface conditions, physics, or the likely outcomes. And particularly if we're using 2D to reflect a three-dimensional system. To build these models and to make them operate correctly, we have to oversimplify and generalize the subsurface conditions sometimes. The reason we do this is so that we can have efficiency in the model development uh, so that it can be presented appropriately and it makes it easier to build and run the model and interpret the analyses. So George Box, his quotes and his interpretation of modeling and model analyses was that it's very difficult to predict accurately with precision outcomes of very complex systems that have many uncertainties or many unknowns. But he also recognized that if we can build the models with enough input from, from reality, that, that it can represent, it can closely represent as good as possible the, the conditions, then the results of modeling tools can be very useful in decision making. But we have to remember that not all models accurately predict complex systems but they can be very useful. The next few slides give an example of what George Box's interpretation of modeling and numerical analysis, um, how it applies to a geotechnical and seepage model setting. So we have an example here of a simple dam. It's got shells upstream, downstream. It's probably got a low permeable core material and foundation. So assuming that we have um, spatial homogeneity, and isotropic conditions, K horizontal equals K vertical. We put these parameters together into a seepage model. We run it in 2D and we end up getting results for the gradient at different parts through the system. We get velocity, we get flow pressures. We get all that information out of this simplified seepage model. And this is great. If this truly represents the condition of a project, then those results very much help us understand the seepage issues, the potential for internal erosion, and possibly various failure modes. However, if the foundation is oversimplified, we might get results that do not. So here's the next example. What if we've mischaracterized the complexity of the foundation? What if it has many more layers or lenses or or spatial configurations of geologic units that don't have uh, iso don't have engineering is isotropy. They're highly anisotropic, and we rerun the model now. Is or is our homogeneous model going to reflect the results and the conditions that we get in this real world condition?
This is an example of the Brumadinho tailing storage facility, which failed in 2019 and killed over 260 people. The initial pre-failure seepage assessment assumed a phreatic surface that did not that did not take into nuance or detail features that were related to the tailing and the tailing deposits. The, the data they used was from piezometers that screened over large distances, and those piezometer readings were then bleeding out or averaging or lumping in the actual phreatic surfaces. So after the failure, the, the back analyzed phreatic surface during the forensic study found that there was probably trapped water, perched water within sand layers that are part of a natural tailing, tailing deposit. So, so the phreatic surface that was assumed in the stability analysis did not accurately represent the nuanced, subtle, elevated pore pressures that were closer to the dam face down near the toe, which is part of the failure trigger mechanism. So these small, subtle features can have a significant impact on the actual physical results or the presence of seepage or instability at a site. All right, so what do we mean by a geologic conceptual model? When, when I reference this term, what I mean is that we are building a three-dimensional understanding of the spatial subsurface conditions, the physical attributes of the subsurface geology, we are understanding the engineering properties of the different packages or units or conditions that are in the, in the foundation. And, and this 3D interpretation needs to conform to and account for all of the geologic settings, the observations, and the information and data that we're able to evaluate. This, this, this interpretation and understanding needs to be sufficiently detailed, defensible, and verifiable. This is sort of a phased approach. As more information becomes available, we might go back and revise our, our interpretation and revise our understanding of the spatial extent of the conditions. We need to also be able to communicate it in geologic cross-sections, on maps, in diagrams, on figures, graphics, plots, and with all the supporting data, the analysis, and the interpretation documented. And then another thing we need to be able to do is compile all this information using 3D geologic block or fence diagrams or GIS or Google Earth, where we can attribute and layer the site conditions and, and better communicate the information to project team. So a concept model is not necessarily the same thing as a numerical or a CAD type model. When I say concept model, it is our understanding and communication of the three-dimensional geologic conditions, not necessarily a, a physical model. Good site characterization is a multidisciplinary effort. It involves engineering geology, geotechnical engineering, soil and rock mechanics, hydrology, hydrogeology, geomorphology, soil science, geophysics, surveying, remote sensing, field studies, and spatial data compilation and synthesis. That's like in a GIS or on CAD or in a, in a Google Earth type model. This is often a phased or iterative approach, and it may consist of one, evaluating the existing documents that are available, go through all background information, look at construction photos, uh, review documents, review foundation reports, review design reports. We have to build our understanding of how it was built and what the conditions were and how those conditions were interpreted to begin with. We need to compile it all and present it in a way that is um, easy to understand for other team members. We need to define the geologic conditions, the geologic history and processes that existed at a site, and the overall depositional or emplacement setting where the foundation materials came from. How did they get to be in the place they are and what was the processes that took place? We need to develop a preliminary concept model, right? So that's our visualization, our understanding of the three-dimensional site conditions that likely exist based on all of our interpretive efforts done uh, ahead of time. We might then, based on the 
Failure modes being evaluated we may have to identify technical data gaps or where, where are the uncertainties with that assessment because then we can target those perhaps with a field study, field investigation. And of course, this might involve drilling, sampling, testing. It will involve or should involve some field mapping, test tranches. Uh, it might include geophysics, remote sensing, LIDAR, topography evaluations, field, field investigations that target our are known uh, our technical data gaps relative to an internal erosion failure mode. Then we need to update our geologic concept, right? So we developed a conceptual model early in this process. We need to take additional data that we obtain and revise that physical model to, to update it to be reflective of all the data and all the information we now know. And then of course, like I said before, we need to characterize this information clearly to the project team so that we can all make good informed inf decisions relative to potential failure modes. I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that we would also do a summary of the different sub-disciplines of geology that are often required or, or their, their expertise needed in evaluating subsurface flow, groundwater flow, seepage flow, or the, the the mechanics of the foundation, the conditions that might contribute to internal erosion failure mode. So we often reference hydrogeology, hydrogeologists. They are a sub-discipline of geology and they study the occurrence, distribution and movement of groundwater within a porous media and through a rock mass system or through a basin type system. Often when we are looking at seepage flows or, or internal erosion type failure modes, instead of delineating rock units or layers based on their geotechnical engineering properties or even their geologic properties, we sometimes might differentiate those units based on their hydrostratigraphy. So a hydrostratigraphy map will differentiate soil and rock units that have actually a similar hydraulic conductivity, permeability, porosity, transmissivity, um, capacity to generate uh, large volumes or, or flow paths and that sort of thing. So sometimes we can separate a project site on cross sections or you know, on boreholes based on the hydro properties of the subsurface conditions. Geomorphology is also a subdiscipline of the overarching blanket that we call geology. This is an interdisciplinary science and it's based on physics, chemistry, biology, mathematics of natural systems that are occur in and around on the earth surface. So it helps us evaluate the surficial processes and the landforms that are created. This geomorphological assessment will help us understand the development, transformation and evolution of landforms in it by applying an understanding of the past and present erosional, transport, and depositional processes that characterize the spatial distribution, the physical conditions, the geometry, the topography, and the engineering properties of soil and rock. So we often will need hydrogeologists or hydrogeology background and geomorphology or geomorphological background on the project team to assess the, the site conditions and get and develop an accurate site characterization. Okay, so now we're going to talk about some of the soil features and conditions that may be present in the foundation and how those conditions may influence or be attributed to internal erosion and seepage related failure. So we start with evaluation of the geomorphic environments that are controlling our project site. Dams and levees tend to be located in valleys or topographic low-lying areas or along existing drainage systems and that these are almost always formed and shaped by erosional, transport, and depositional processes. Geologically recent accumulations, so quaternary sediments that are generally less than 2.6 million years old, will likely be present at a site to some degree. And so understanding the, the site morphology, the depositional history, and the depositional systems that are in place requires us applying the principles of geomorphology. Some of the more 
common uh, surficial depositional systems are circled here in with the black circles. You have dunes and lakes and beach deposits, tel tidal, tidal flats and deltas. But um, some of the more common depositional systems that we encounter at a dam or, or levee site might actually come from alluvial systems, fluvial systems, or glacial or uh, colluvial type depositional environments. So this is a plot or a table, excuse me, that lists out a lot of those uh, depositional systems that we saw in the previous slide. What we know about these systems from, from geomorphology and, and the processes that emplace these, these deposits at a site is that we can put some constraint or some um, knowledge of the conditions that are likely relative to our understanding of the depositional system that's at, at your site. If we have a fluvial environment, we're going to be dealing probably with sands to gravels, uh, sand silt clay types deposits that have um, high to moderate grain size variability, and they may be moderately continuous like overbank floodplain deposits, or they may be discontinuous like a small channel on one part of an abutment. So for alluvial fans, glacial, colluvial, and all these other depositional systems, we can apply the principles of geomorphology to understand the material conditions and the material distributions and what we can expect in terms of continuity of those deposits, how they relate to each other, and, and we can build our concept model early in a process if we understand the depositional system that's in place. Fluvial processes are associated with the erosion, the transport, and the deposition of alluvial material. It's also related to the spatial stratigraphic sequences and the layering that are resulting from these, these accumulations, the distribution and the geometric relationship of alluvial packages, and the landforms that are created by flowing surface water, such as rivers, streams, and alluvial fans. Alluvium, which is composed of clay, silt, sand, gravel, cobbles to boulder sized material, are deposited along a river system as a function of the river flow transport capacity, its carrying capacity. That involves the load, it's the flow volumes, the flow velocity, the depth of the flows, time, and overall energy of the system. As you can see in the images depicted on the slide, there's a lot of different um, components to a river, river and deposition accumulation system can have very complicated overprinting juxtaposition or truncation of one one alluvial depositional system or package um, onto an older alluvial package so we also can have different energy levels on different parts of a flowing stream system you know for example higher energy on the outside of a bend where you have perhaps erosion occurring on the outside and then deposition occurring on the inside of the bend. All these, all these deposits which are falling out of suspension at different uh, bed load capacities are overprinting or layering on top of one another. This can create complex distribution of alluvial deposits. And this map up in the upper right shows the map of channel migration and um, bends and abandoned channels along a reach of the Mississippi River. We can see how complicated all these different deposits can be in a, in a specific setting. There are many different types, configurations, uh, and compositions of fluvial deposits and different depositional environments that we have to understand um, before we can assess what, what the depositional history has been along a river system. So therefore we have to understand something about the valley grade and the velocities of the channel, the width of the channel, the channel type, shape, um, what are the conditions at the site that are controlling the geomorphological observations? Are we having erosion in one part and deposition in the other? Is, is, has the stream migrated or, or changed direction or, or some orientations? 
Um, these different conditions that are depicted on this slide kind of show how complicated the different uh, fluvial system um, geomorphology may be at a project site. And all these have significant influence on either internal erosion failure modes or seepage through a foundation. So understanding the complexity, how these different geologic or depositional packages have been in place, understanding if they are cross-cutting or they have deg degraded an older deposit and are truncating, uh, truncating one, if they are linear or if they're anastomosing and, and highly sinuous across a dam abutment, for example. So understanding the geomorphology, interpreting the, the landforms that exist at a site can help us can help inform us about which types of depositional systems and what type of material might be in place in at a project site and, and also where what's its lateral and spatial extent. So understanding the fluvial system is very important for assessing internal erosion failure modes across a uh, Alluvial fans are, are conical, semi-conical, mounded, and wedge-shaped accumulations of water-transported material that accumulates where a steep valley channel exits onto a lower grade topography. So at a range front or at a main stem channel that's in the valley bottom. What happens is as the, as the flows exit onto the range front, onto the fan, the the grades change and the energy decreases and material starts to fall out of suspension or out of the carrying capacity of the, of the flows. Um, and they, the flows can separate as well. For the most part, what happens is there's, a, there's a, a couple main channels that exit out onto the fan and those can carry very coarse material. That's where the high energy is. And sometimes debris flows come down and choke up those main channels, it jumps its bank, it floods out and distributes over the whole fan surface. So the channels and the main and the coarse material and the fine material are all sort of interfingered with each other and distributed over the entirety of the fan. This creates sort of in cross section from shown in B to B prime cross section, we have the mound of the fan and we have all the lenticular shaped um, accumulations of coarse material all the way up to fine material that's deposited on the on the low energy realm of the of the flow surface. The interesting part is that a lot of the channelization is coming down from the range front and and toward the toe of the fan. So the shape of those gravel and coarse material deposits might actually be parallel or semi-parallel to the orientation of a dam. If these are located in the abutment, which, which you would mostly expect, your, your seepage flow path might actually be across all these lenticular shaped features. Of course, they can also be inset or uh, connected. So, so that's what we're looking for is the, where's the coarse material? Where's the fine material? Is there an opportunity across a seepage flow path relative to the depositional system that can either support a roof and an eroded uh, fine sand type material, or is there a open works gravel or a high permeable gravel material that can accept uh, internal erosion to occur from either upstream foundation or, or from the embankment that's sitting right on top of it. Fluvial terrace deposits are remnants of earlier floodplain and channel accumulations that existed at a time when the river was at a higher elevation or was in a different position. So these are the, these are the river and the alluvium accumulations that occurred during a previous um, river orientation and river elevation. So these deposits are sometimes called lag deposits because they've been left behind up higher on the slope than where the current um, the current channel may be sitting. So these features are often deposited on an old, um, an old, an old surface. Maybe it's an old weathered surface of, or a soil surface that was there before the river started to deposit in those locations. So these these deposits often are older than the current alluvium. They might um, they might be more cemented. They might be more dense. They may have less or more weathering, so they may be more clay generated within the matrix. 
Um, or, or they can be sitting on buried channels. There can be buried channels in an upper abutment, or there can be an old paleo soil, a old, an old soil horizon that's easily weathered or has high, high parameters for seepage. So other types of deposits that can be in these positions on dam abutments might be volcanic deposits, so pyroclastic accumulations that then have been eroded. And so you have erosional remnants positioned high up on the abutments that can pose seepage issues if the underlying rock is is weak or weathered or has or it has coarse material buried down in the bottom of those those deposits. Landslide materials can also accumulate on high up on the abutments and be eroded. Open work gravel deposits or open framework gravel consists of coarse material, typically you know up to four inch and a little bit below, sometimes it can be larger, but consists of granular gravelly material that has been that's well sorted and it's been deposited in a way that it lacks any interstitial fines or sand infilling matrix. It's class supported. So it has a very large interconnected void space. These type of deposits have been very concerning with respect to assessing internal erosion failure modes because they can represent a susceptibility to internal migration and soil contact erosion. So if these deposits are present in the foundation and they're of continuity that allows for the migration and transport of other sediments through their void space, what we can have is a failure mode related to either erosion of foundation material, so a fine sand or, or silty material gets washed in through those interstitial spaces and transported and carried away, or material from the embankment or the core is able to get washed or flushed into these deposits and of course transported away, resulting in, in stoping and possibly sinkhole development and breach of a embankment structure. However, these are really difficult these are really difficult deposits to characterize because they don't exist in a lot of depositional systems. They're very, very hard to drill, sample, and test and evaluate spatially. So one of the one of the main issues though is that geomorphological research on these types of deposits and, and also evaluations by people like Terzaghi in, in memos have identified these as being pretty unique in terms of their spatial distribution and unique in their open framework system. So getting the right hydraulic and geologic depositional systems in place where you leave only the coarse fraction of, of the of the river carrying or the water carrying capacity and everything else gets flushed away is pretty difficult. Some of the examples of where these can form would be on outwash braided stream deposits, um, esker deposits, so there's some some types of uh, glacial deposits where just the coarse material is piled up and left behind. Talus and scree slopes off of steep slopes, those may be very gravelly. Sometimes on coarse beach deposits where there's a where there's a rock, a rocky source for accumulating that material. But other evidence though suggests that if these if these materials are subsequently buried and covered with finer grain sand, silts, or clay deposits, then over time a lot of those materials might migrate and flush into the void space and slowly plug it up. So it's been very difficult to characterize or find laterally extensive um, open work gravel deposits that have this positioning and configuration where they can represent this type of failure this type of failure mode. Few depositional systems are as diverse as those related to glacial processes and glacial uh, depositional systems. And the material characteristics can wild can, can vary wildly um, in, in in short distances over over the area of a, of these deposits. There are two primary types of glacial systems. There's alpine glaciers, which are shown on the upper left here. These occur, these these occur in mountainous topography, where the flow direction of the of the 
advancing glacier is confined by valley rock rock topography. So the the flow is controlled by the existing topography. Continental ice sheet type glaciers that are shown over on the right, these are very thick and massive and they overwhelm the underlying topography. So their flow direction really is reflective of the ice loading and uh, lo the, the ice loading regime that is advancing that sheet. These different systems generate slightly different types of geomorphological and um, glacial depositional systems. There are different types of glacial deposits. Till is what's referenced as the material that's deposited directly by the ice. This can consist of basal till, also called lodgement till, which accumulates along the base of the advancing glacier. This can be very highly compacted and quite dense, usually low permeability material because of the overriding compression and also mixture of, of clay and silt that's in, embedded within the matrix. Then there's ablation till. An ablation till is deposited by melting ice or retreating ice along the margins. So these are like the moraines that form on the outside edge. These may be less um, well compacted or well densified. There's outwash material. So as the glacier retreats and melts and the, the large amount of water breaks through the moraines or breaks through the low spots and rushes downward, it's, it's carrying lots of material. These usually occur in sort of braided stream systems that are very wide, usually high energy, usually multiple um, main stream flows. And so these can, these can generate lots of coarse deposits that spread out over quite a large area. There's also glacial lacustrine. So these are lakes that form in the scoured depressions or behind temporarily, um, or temporarily dammed by, by end moraines. So these also have deltas from the meltwater that flow into the upper reach of the lake and then laminated fines that fall out of suspension, sort of in a rhythmic fashion, depending on, on seasonality. Those are called varved clays. So, so you can get lacustrum clays, which may be quite weak and they may have very different or anisotropic conditions horizontally and vertically in terms of permeability. To understand which types of materials might be present um, over the area that the glacial materials have been um, uh, transported and deposited, we have to understand something about the features, the geomorphic features, the land features that are expressed at a at a site. The, the glacier's gone, long gone in some cases, retreated, and there's no longer any evidence of the actual ice there, of course. So we have to be able to understand from a geomorphical, geomorphological perspective, what are the features that we're looking at? And some of those features are shown in the, and depicted on these images and figures here. We have the moraines. You can have end moraines, lateral moraines, recessional moraines, medial moraines, ground moraines, all these different types of material that's been basically bulldozed and left in place around the edges or margins or at contacts with, with the ice. We also have drumlins, eskers, canes, cane terraces, outwash plains, glacial lakes. All these features are associated with um, with water flow and how material falls out from underneath the, the glacier, the, the irregularities in the base of the flow, which can um, create pockets of material that fall out of the ice load. So all these create different challenges in terms of understanding what the seepage potential or internal erosion features might um, Lacustrine or lake deposits are low energy, low energy accumulations of typically clays and silts. Often there's very fine sands interbedded within the within the sequence, but these are these are deposits that accumulate in calm, um, low energy environments, and they accumulate very rhythmically, depending on seasonality, depending on the erosion that's going on or the inflow of material from, from whatever river system is, is feeding the lake. And they, they accumulate in layers of fine sand, silt, clay, fine sand, silt, clay. And these, these conditions may have extremely different 
vertical versus vertical versus horizontal hydraulic conductivities. So you may have a condition where you have very, very low vertical conductivity, but you may have a few seams or layers that then are having, then with larger hydraulic conductivity where most of your flow might be occurring in that direction. So these are, these are obviously things to think about and consider when we're evaluating internal erosion failure modes or seepage issues. The other thing to remember from the Bermondino uh, example is that the piezometer screen size and sensing zone um, may be bleeding out or generalizing what the actual phreatic or potentiometric surface is along a certain seam or, or layer in this scenario. Colluvium or slope wash it generally consists of unconsolidated heterogeneous mass of soil and rock fragments that accumulate along or at the base of a hill slope. This material is generated from the weathering of the underlying bedrock, and it's migrated downslope by rainwater, slope wash, gravity, and, and just sort of a slow continuous creep relating to freeze thaw, wetting drying, or expansion contraction cycles. You're possibly a combination of these. This material is usually wedge shape toward the base as shown in these uh, in this diagram in the upper right. It can be interfingered with um, the alluvium down in the river valley. Uh, they can form in pockets. Often the colluvial material might become thicker in previous drainage swales where it would be allowed to accumulate and it might be much thinner where there's ridges and high, and high rock conditions. The, the variability and the permeability of this material could be very high. And a lot of times, colluvium gets either mapped or identified as other type of deposit or mis misinterpreted as rock because you can drill, be drilling into, for example, this lower right and see hard, strong rock, and it might get identified as such. So we have to understand what the extent and impact might be of a large colluvial wedge, how continuous is it upstream to downstream, and does it relate to a potential seepage or internal erosion failure mode. Aeolian deposits are air fall accumulations where, where the flowing, flowing air has picked up uh, particles from a distant area, a distant desert or a distant, uh, distant source of fine sand, silt, and clay, transported at sometimes huge distances, and then lets these accumulations fall out of suspension, just like in a, an alluvial environment. So when, when these deposits all get separated, you get massive accumulations of uh, sand, sand and sand, perhaps sand dunes, or you get silt and clay accumulations that are often referenced as losses. Silty loss deposits um, can be exceptionally challenging because they that the individual particles end up in a what's called like a delicate structure, delicate structure, and it can it can be quite strong. It can stand up almost vertically on a cliff face, but once it gets wet, it can compress and consolidate um, and lose strength quite rapidly. So if if there's loose deposits, uh, it may be in a foundation or along a spillway and it gets wet, you can have a uh, differential settlement of the embankment or overlying structures, which can call, cause cracking and therefore internal erosion. Um, this material also can be highly erodible um, unless it has some amount of clay or cohesion embedded within the Lewis deposit. Other airfall deposits might be associated with ash or volcanic type debris that falls out of the air. And similarly, these deposits can be quite extensive and they are uniform in size and shape and usually quite massive and, and continuous at the scale of a, of a project or abutment. So we need to understand what the extent and conditions are at, at our Mass wasting or landslide deposits are geomorphic pr processes by which soil and rock move down slope as a continuous or discontinuous mass under the force of gravity. This is due to loss of strength in, a, in, a, in the soil mass or dislodgement due to changes in strength or loading conditions, seismic or increased pore pressure or unloading of a, of a slow tote or due to construction or other, other mechanisms. 
There are many different types of landslide deposits. A number of them are shown in the figure here on the left. Um, they can create different shapes and different geomorphic configurations and, and extents. Knowing the different landslide um, mechanisms and geometries helps us identify which type of process is existing at a, at a particular site. They can be rotational, translational, there can be debris flows, earth flows, rock, rock slides, rock falls. Maybe it's a rock slide that's related to wedge, planar, or toppling type failures. Um, the geometries that they form and the material conditions that they settle in are also re related to the, to the rock mass, the type of material involved in the slide, and the, the speed and the geometry of the landslide. So understanding the morphology helps us understand what the potential is for flow and seepage issues if these are positioned under a dam. As you can see in the upper right image of the continental US, landslides tend to occur in obviously hilly or steep terrain, which is a lot of uh, terrain where, where we might have dams positioned. So it's, it's feasible that we can have slope failures or landslide materials or deposits accumulated in the foundation of a dam. If they are positioned in that in the abutment or, or under the dam, they can they can have differing seepage potential. They can be they can have extension. They can have perched water. They can have tension cracks. They can be um, open and weak, and they can allow water flowing through them. Or they can have uh, shear surfaces and clay masses within them that they're actually barriers to water flow. So understanding the mechanics and the conditions of a landslide that may be positioned near or in the foundation can um, help us assess. Residual soils are composed of rock that has been decomposed and degraded by both mechanical and chemical weathering processes. These processes break down the rock structure into smaller and smaller and smaller fragments to eventually form the soils that may then be transported or deposited by other geomorphic processes. The intensity, depth, nature of the weathering is completely dependent on the climate, so the precipitation and temperature of the region, uh, the slopes that exist, steep slopes versus shallow slopes, the rock type that is in existence and the degree of fracturing and possibly the strength of that rock, vegetation, chemistry of the infiltrating water, as well as some biological factors that can influence um, soil development. So when soils accumulate in place without significant erosion or transport, the weathering profile and layering created is referenced as the soil horizons. And these may, all of these may have different engineering properties associated with strength, stability, hydraulic conductivity, and, and influences on seepage or flow paths. The underlying rock conditions also control the depth, nature, location of the soil horizon profile. So this can consist of bedding, Bedding layers, contacts, joints, degree of fracturing, faults, shears, alteration zones, or other rock properties. So cars, for example, these may dictate the spatial geometry of the soils that are being generated, the type of soils that are being generated, and shape and lateral continuity. This also can influence the spatial variability of seepage or um, stability or deformation in an embankment. A special case is shown down on the lower right, which is an extreme example of what's called core stone or spheroidal weathering. This happens in crystalline rock masses that have uh, fracture systems, three usually, three to four fracture systems, and the weathering degradation occurs exclusively along those joint sets. And what happens is, is it weathers into a saprolytic, almost soil-like consistency, but that keeps an interior core stone of very hard, very strong uh, crystalline rock. This is, can be a challenge for characterization. It can be a challenge for controlling seepage paths because these seepage paths through that soil material might be highly contorted and very difficult to predict. Similar to dams that are founded on a soil foundation, 
uh, embankments and concrete dams and spillways that are founded on rock or with rock close to their, their foundation elevations are susceptible to seepage issues, internal erosion, scour, failure modes related to water flowing um, along or through the bedrock mass geologic features or discontinuities. So understanding and characterizing the geologic conditions that influence seepage in a rock foundation is important for evaluating the potential failure mode mechanics, developing representative seepage models, and assessing various mitigation alternatives that can help control, monitor, or manage seepage. So this section will focus on some of the main criteria that need to be understood if we're assessing a foundation um, at a project site that's, that's composed of a bedrock. We need to understand something about the bedrock type, structural geology, rock mass discontinuities and features, weathering, hydrothermal alteration, and then we'll, we also need to understand if there's unique geologic features or conditions that may exist given the deposition or the emplacement history of a site. This is a little bit busy figure, but basically it's a kind of cool, colorful graphic that shows us the various rock types and the overall uh, geologic rock cycle um, in a graphical format. So knowing something about the rock type, where it came from, how it got there, what its history has been, so what's the story, what story does the rock tell, that, that informs us, that can inf preliminary and preliminarily inform us about the porosity and permeability, the strength and the modulus of, of that foundation material. It can tell us something about fracture propagation and fracture uh, openness and continuity and orientations to some degree. It can tell us about the mineralogy uh, alteration or depositional systems. It tells us about uh, maybe what kind of weathering or how, how intense or deep or extensive the weathering may be. Um, and, and maybe the state of stress that it may be under, have undergone to create discontinuities or other features that might be related to seepage. So understanding the rock type, its emplacement history, the story of the rock that composes the foundation is important for preliminarily getting to an understanding of the, the physical prop principles that may uh, make, make internal erosion uh, favorable or unfavorable. Structural geology evaluates the three-dimensional history and orientation of the stress, stress regimes within the Earth's crust that are responsible for deformation and displacement between different rock types, different rock units, or larger scale geologic terrains. Often these displacements are associated with compression, for instance, thrust faulting and, and fold structures, or they might be related to extension and tension developing within the rock mass, like uh, along a normal fault. They can also be associated with uh, translation, strike-slip faulting. Um, usually it's a combination of these where you have some oblique orientation of faulting and, and stress history that causes multiple types of, of fracturing or discontinuities to be generated within a rock, otherwise unfractured rock mass. So understanding the structural geology of the site is important for engineering geologists and hydrogeologists because it provides a basis for interpreting the current rock state of stress, and these inform us about the development, the orientation, continuity, maybe the relative openness or tightness of discontinuity networks. This also might tell us if there's uh, weaknesses or geologic defects within the rock system that we need to be concerned about. These tell us a lot about the kinematics, the, the overall rock fracture and discontinuity system that breaks up the rock mass. And this can help us evaluate the orientation and extent of fracture networks. This might be applicable to a karst terrain, for, system, for example. If the karst system is following a uh, fracture pattern, we might be able to have some level of understanding of how the orientation of that system might exist in, in a foundation. So these geologic structural conditions, in conjunction with the rock type and the emplacement or depositional history of the rock masses, these are also related to characterizing the likely subsurface flow pathways or conduits or, or features that might be barriers to flow 
that can control large-scale groundwater movement as well as localized seepage within or through the foundation of a dam or a levee. Faults and shears are structural breaks in the rock mass where differential movement has occurred along a surface or a zone of failure. These planar breaks and surfaces are typically characterized by crushed and shattered rock uh, or polished clay surfaces. Often we can differentiate direction of movement based on striations or slick and slides. And uh, typically there's some fault gouge or breccia that uh, forms along those surfaces. So movement along those faults and shears can crush all the grains and, and increase weathering as water gets trapped or percolates through the fault zone. These, these, these weather the, the crushed rock into potentially a clay or fine grain type material. Those can often represent a very tight or, or even low hydraulic conductivity feature. So, so often a fault gouge zone might even be a barrier to, to subsurface flows. Um, alternatively, often one side of a fault block may experience more differential movement and more strain than another side. So that, that side that's moved more potentially is more broken up, more highly fractured, and maybe has more open, con continuous fractures throughout one side of the fault rock mass. So these features that break and crush the rock up are potential contributors to, um, to seepage flow. And they have some, some considerations we need to evaluate. So is there a potential for the fault to be a conduit? Is the fault zone or the brescia zone possibly a barrier to flow? Or does the, does the water perhaps move through a more highly fractured mass of rock, not necessarily on the fault, but possibly along it or adjacent to it? Can the barrier redirect flows or high transmissivity zones redirect flows away from where we think they're going? Can the open rock mass and, and crushed rock mass result in weakened or softened material along or across that contact? So if there's more erodible material along the fault zone, it can be weaker to greater depths, possibly easily scoured or removed during um, flow events. Like, uh, fault zones or, or displaced rock masses can also cause differential settlement of the foundation. This might result in cracking of the embankment, cracking of the core, which can also relate to internal erosion through the embankment structure, even though it's related to foundation defects. Um, and the other thing is, could there, can there be secondary mineralization along the fault zone? Often calcite or gypsum can infill a lot of those fracture systems, and those may weather away or be eroded away or dissolved away over time, increasing permeability, changing the overall seepage parameters. River downcutting or even valley glacial ice melting results in a condition where the state of stress is, is changed. The confinement on the valley side slopes and the confinement at the bottom are removed and the principal stresses reorient themselves in the rock mass on the valley side slopes, the principal stresses orient themselves parallel to the subparallel to the slope orientation. In the valley bottom, the principal stresses orient themselves parallel to that surface, to that valley bottom surface. What happens then is, is the rock mass is able to move or be, re, be deformed into those free surfaces. That's the stress relief component. So, so blocks and, and rock mass on the abutments tends to relax into toward the valley. The bedding planes or fractures or, or discontinuities in the foundation then may pop open as it rebounds up into the valley floor. So this creates a condition where we have potentially open fracture systems that are trending upstream and downstream and may be hydraulically connected to the reservoir. They also can have increased weathering and contain weak weathered or sheared material. And they represent a potential a failure mode. And we need to assess the potential for rebound, rebound fractures to exist at a site. In 1965, there was a internal erosion failure mode that almost failed Fontenelle Dam. This was 
the product of stress relaxation features that were not removed in the right abutment. And the water migrated through and started an erosion pathway and started to cause piping and transportation, transport of materials in that abutment. Did not fail, but it came very, very close to it. Another example of stress relief is related to exfoliation or sheet fracturing in typically crystalline rock masses, so granitic type rocks. This is, these, these rock masses um, cooled at depth and under extreme pressures, and they locked in all of their confinement stress. When those rock masses have been uplifted or, or erosion has exposed them at the ground surface, those internal stresses far exceed the confinement stress that's on them when they're exposed to a, to a free surface, and it causes uh, uh, popping or fractures to propagate that are parallel to the ground surface. So if you're in a, a, a granitic uh, crystalline terrain, that may be a condition that needs to be evaluated for a seepage pathway. Rock mass permeability is controlled by two parameters. The primary porosity, which is the porosity or the permeability of the intact portion of the rock mass, meaning the intergranular void space. And then it's also controlled by the secondary porosity, which is controlled by the discontinuity types and features that break up the otherwise intact rock mass. Primary porosity is usually very, very low compared to the secondary porosity. So secondary porosity pretty much controls most of the seepage and internal erosion issues that we need to characterize. So when we're, when we're gathering data to understand what the potential is for an internal erosion failure mode, we need to have information about the joints, fractures, fissures, and cracks that break up the rock mass. This is on regional and localized scale. And this can be related to the tectonic stresses or crustal stre stresses we talked about in the previous slides. This is also related to the intact strength of the rock, how brittle it is, and orientation and stress history. This can also be, um, rocks can also be fractured due to intrusive pressures. So an intrusion of, of magma comes in and it creates a, a huge pressure zone and it can cause fracturing along the, along the parameters parameters. We also need to look at bedding plane surfaces, layers, and lenses. We need to always be looking at varying contacts, contacts between not just bedding or layers or intrusive contacts, but also, you know, unconformities or disconformities that, that represent a potential seepage path and um, structural contacts between different rock masses of different uh, parameters. Foliations are thin planar arrangements of mineralogical or textural partings in a rock, and those can often control some of the seepage flows and fracture systems. And the schistosity and cleavage, similar to foliations, it's a sheet-like grains that are arranged in a preferred orientation. So we need to understand what the permeability is and how these, all these features are oriented relative to our seepage pathway. So once we've characterized the types of discontinuities that may be at a at a abutment site in the foundation that are potentially related to internal erosion failure mechanisms, the main question that we need to ask ourselves is down here at the bottom. What is the capacity of those rock mass defects, those discontinuities, to move water and potentially move soil materials? So to answer that question, we have a number of important factors that we need to assess in order to characterize this, this potential failure mode. We need to understand something about the contact that the discontinuity makes with the dam foundation or soil materials in the foundation. How does that feature intersect the area that we're concerned about in the dam foundation? We need to know something about the orientation of the discontinuity relative to adverse seepage flow paths alignment. The dam and the reservoir configuration, does it, is it hydraulically connected to the reservoir through the foundation? Does it connect with the dam foundation surface? Does it have a daylighting um, point downstream for which to discharge water or, or materials? What's the aperture of the discontinuity, the relative openness 
uh, and width of these features. If they are extremely open and have a large volume, then maybe we don't need to see material coming out downstream. Maybe we can bury all the material within the rock fractures if it's severely fractured enough. Are there infilling materials that can be washed away or that possibly help resist the flow pass? Maybe it, it's a clay infilling that is tight and does not lend itself to erosion. What's the continuity of the discontinuities at the scale of the seepage path? So this has to do with the length, the trace length of the discontinuity. Does it have very long trace length and we have a, a super highway flow path where water can and material can, can move easily? Or do we have them spaced, small ones that are spaced tightly apart and we have a more torturous flow path? We also need to know something about the spacing, relative spacing of discontinuities, and then the surface condition. Rough, tight joints might create a more torturous flow path, reduce the, the flow volume and velocity. Infilling of the discontinuities in a rock mass can have a significant influence on our assessment of permeability. If we test this material or we have instrumentation that's in a rock mass that has uh, fractures, but they're infilled with tight and strong stiff clay. Maybe we have a cemented sand that's infilling a rock fracture. There can be gypsum in some uh, rock masses as well as calcium carbonate, calcite in, in some crystalline rock masses. When those tests or when those packer tests are performed in those materials, we might get a false sense of low permeability because those, those those discontinuities are restricting the flow of water. But over time, these materials might dissolve or get washed out. This increases the permeability of the rock mass and, and then changes the hydraulic gradients across the abutment or through the, through the seepage flow path. And this can result in more open discontinuities and overall increasing the void and the permeability of of seepage flow paths to move material, to move water, and to have a higher capacity to cause internal erosion. So removal of the infilling material, and particularly the calcite or gypsum, can result in lower rock mass modulus as well. And when this happens, you can get settlement and cracking of the overlying embankment, which then can result in internal erosion through the core. We already discussed weathering in terms of development of residual soils. So this is a reiteration of, of some of the information on that slide, but rock is degraded and weathered both chemically and physically. And it depends a lot on the intact rock strength, on the degree of rock fracturing and discontinuities throughout the rock mass, water flow through the rock mass, um, and other processes that occur throughout those discontinuities can be related to freezing thawing cycles, uh, wetting drying, extreme temperature fluctuations, uh, sometimes crystal and salt growth can precipitate and ex exert pressure on joints and open them, joint water uh, pressure cycles, or growth of tree roots over time. A lot of times the depth and extent of weathering also depends on the degree of fracturing and on the degree of, of jointing that, that's breaking up the rock mass. These can, these can cause uh, difficulties in assessing where the seepage flow paths are if we have deeply weathered rock in irregular areas, perhaps along a shear or fault zone that is not well documented. So, so we have to understand where and how the weathering process occurs and where it's occurring relative to specific discontinuities. Hydrothermal alteration usually occurs due to the injection or intrusion of hydrothermal fluids, uh, usually in the proximity of igneous intrusive rock masses that are forced up into the overlying rock structure. Um, this occurs under a variety of pressures, temperatures, uh, fluid acidity, chemical makeup of the injected hydrothermal fluids, and how much dissolution occurs of the intact or, or overlying rock mass. These environments cause mineralogical and chemical modifications or changes from the original host rock. On the 
On the right photo, we see kind of an example of hydrothermal alteration that's occurred along specific joints, discontinuities, and rock features, maybe faults, and that sort of thing. On the left is a, is a diagram for a typical intrusive pluton and the hydrothermal alteration zones and halos that form around the, the mass of the intrusion, the, the host body of the intrusion. You can see on the one side we get argillic, you get clay alteration as a function of distance away from the main intrusive body. So we can get a lot of clay clay composition, clay mineralogy forming in what was originally a pretty intact rock mass, rock structure. So the, the key is that these things can extend to significant depths and have high ir, highly irregular geometric formations. So they can be very difficult to hunt down, trace down and predict where they're gonna be. But they can represent potential failure mode because they are basically uh, discontinuities that may have infilling of weaker softer material that can be eroded or flushed out. While well, seepage through fractured rock mass can be related to many different structural conditions and, and different types of discontinuities, there are some specific geologic settings and processes that can facilitate adverse seepage um, conditions or have been consistently shown in the past to be problematic relative to seepage or internal erosion failure modes. Some of the unique Geologic conditions that we might need to be concerned about are cavities, caverns, karst systems. Uh, volcanic terrain can pose significant uh, issues related to seepage or internal erosion. Uh, coal seams and other anthropogenic or human-induced features. Most naturally occurring subsurface cavity systems develop in rocks that are soluble. That means that they can be dissolved in slightly acidic water that's flowing through the discontinuity system. Most notably, this occurs in limestones, dolomite, gypsum, anhydrite, and other evaporates or rock salt, salt deposits. These types of rocks are very common throughout the United States, as shown in the map in the upper left, and they also exist very commonly throughout the world. Car systems develop by solution widening of joints bedding planes or along other discontinuities, faults, shears, or contacts. And it's caused by flowing groundwater that that's, has a slight carbonic acid content. And this dissolves the calcium carbonate or calcium sulfate component of the, of the limestone or dolomite and opens those joints until it till it enlarges and develops into a heterogeneous arrangement of interconnected cavities and flowways and underground river systems representing a significant internal erosion failure mode if they exist in and around or under a embankment foundation. A number of Army Corps dams have required major foundation modifications over the years to reduce the potential for internal erosion into a karst system that exists in the foundation. Volcanic terrains, formations, associated features can generate a complex subsurface seepage flow network that may be susceptible to internal erosion failure modes. These would be related to open and highly interconnected discontinuity systems, and if they're positioned within or under or around dam foundation, can cause all kinds of um, complexities and issues that need to be evaluated. There can be faults, both structural faults or, you know, related to tectonic stresses, but there can also be faults associated with cooling and degassing of, of a lava flow where it collapses on itself and you can have offsets around a margin. There can be a placement of intrusive that come up through a, a flow or a, or a volcanic formation, and the, that can also cause offset or faulting. There can be layers or deposits of various volcanic materials associated with uh, the flows or ash falls or that sort of thing. This can consist of scoria, brescia, clinker, ash or, or tuff. And these materials can um, be laterally continuous over a long area, and they can be composed of coarse aggregate that might have very high 
permeability, very high porosity, large void ratio that we need to understand and characterize. Lava flowing be below a cooled lava flow surface that eventually empties can form lava tubes throughout, um, throughout a, a large flow deposit. Along the margins of a volcanic flow lobe, you can have baked contacts. So the heat from the flow contacts a, a different material or a different formation, and it creates a contact, creates a alteration of that soil or of that other rock type. There can be cooling joints that form in the lava, like a columnar type type system that has a very, very difficult to characterize uh, chaotic rock fracture system of interconnected near vertical jointing. There's intrusive veins and dikes and sills of all different orientations and different geometries. There's buried and or altered paleo surface. So the, the, the existing pre-existing surface on which the flows or the deposits accumulate can be highly erratic. You know, it's a pre-existing topography, so it can be very erratic. It can be um, difficult to characterize. It can also be composed of uh, paleo soils, old, um, old river bed or channel deposits, or uh, it can have fracturing or other rock fracture, rock discontinuity features that are now buried by subsequent flow. There's also potential for intrusion of fluids through the rock system that can cross cut other rock masses and maybe be a barrier to the, to the flow. This is what we're showing in these upper left two photos where you have an intrusive um, dike that might be of very low permeability, but it's cross-cutting um, the, the flow path of another rock mass. This slide just is showing, again, the complexity of the various uh, volcanic terrains and depositional environments and features that can exist in, in in these environments and characterizing them can be extremely challenging and difficult. This is SWIFT number two. It's a dam in Washington hydropower facility and it failed very rapidly because of high permeable basalts in the foundation had small to large lava tubes that resulted in internal erosion into those features and eventual collapse and breach of the dam. Layered sedimentary bedrock may contain lenses, seams, or layers of organic material that have been subsequently compressed, consolidated, and heated, heated to various degrees to form different varieties of coal. You have peat and lignite at the low end, bituminous and anthracite at the high end of the spectrum. These different coal deposits have potentially different carbon concentrations, different strengths, different weathering behavior and may influence seepage flows over time. At the low end of the spectrum, so peat and lignite, this material can be extremely weak and have low shear strength and potentially compressible, which can cause differential settlement and, and cracking of overlying structures, representing an internal erosion failure mode through the, through the overlying structure. The weaker coals tend to weather more easily and can form a low permeable stratum that can eventually
Okay, so we're going to end here with a few concluding statements and concepts, take-home messages with respect to geologic, geomorphologic considerations related to internal erosion failure mode assessment. First one is that geological conditions clearly contribute to, influence, and may even control many dam performance issues and development of potential failure modes through the foundation and can even be related to issues in the, in the embankment itself. Uh, analytical or numerical models uh, are, are often oversimplification of, of complex subsurface conditions. Um, and, and the results of these models can be extremely valuable, instructive, useful, but they also can lead to some incorrect results, probably some incorrect decisions, and potentially result in higher or high levels of uncertainty with respect to the assessment. Whew. There are many different complex and spatially variable settings, geometries, and conditions. Some perhaps with even subtle engineering property differences. And these can strongly influence failure mode development, uh, configuration, location, uh, rates, and, and relative risk. A sound and defensible geologic concept model should be developed by experienced engineering geologists with understanding of the various internal erosion processes that are related to foundation geology. And this includes understanding the site hydrogeology, geomorphology, structural geology, and other subdisciplines of geology. And lastly, a thorough site characterization that is communicated clearly to decision makers provides so much confidence in the evaluation of the internal erosion risk and potential issues, and it supports more informed and, and more accurate uh, decisions on taking actions or, or doing further studies. So I'd say thank you for your time. Appreciate your attention. If there's any questions, comments, or discussion to be had, we can, we can do that now. Thank you.